Right, let's see if that works. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Ah, video still seems to be running. That's what I'm looking out the window at. Newfangled electric windows down. Well, it's a coolish winter day. Forecast eight degrees, highest temperature. I am just back from the Gambia. Forecast at a high degree, 32 degrees today. So it's somewhat of a culture shock. Let's get that back window wiped as well. How are you? I don't know, have I spoken to you since before Christmas? Probably not. So yeah, so I had two weeks in Mauritius, two weeks off for Christmas, and then two weeks in the Gambia. So, uh, and yesterday was my first day back at work. Now, my first day back at work, I tend to talk too much. I don't do any work, and I just do talk, 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 talk. So that was a problem. When I saw 30 patients a day, <clears throat> it was a problem, because I used to run horrendously late on the first day back until I realized that I couldn't really talk as much as I'd like to. <coughs> Pardon me. Of course, now I'm a private dentist, I can talk a bit more. In fact, I can talk as much as I like to now. So, um, and not only that, the uh, staff done a, did a good job of uh, keeping my first day pretty slack. So, in fact, I had an hour off in the morning, uh, which was good because I developed a leak in one of the chairs. And so we had to replace a bit of pipe and a, and a connector, which we did because, uh, you know, it's not difficult. So... And, uh, you know, it's a bit of fun doing something different. I mean, if it had an electrical problem, I probably would get someone in. But, um, you know, just for the odd bit of leaking pipe, you know, especially when you've got some in the cupboard, you just cut it. You, you pull off the old pipe, cut the new pipe to length and stick it on, don't you? You soon get the hang of um, how to take the side panels off and stuff like that. Right, hang on a second. Let me use my Mark 1 mirror retractor. Of course, in the Gambia, they don't have uh, electric windows. Uh, every They've still got the old wind-down type, you know. Fortunately, having grown up in the era of wind-down windows, I um, was more than happy and knew how to work everything. Weird thing, though, when I was driving to Gatwick, I got um, flashed by a speed camera. It was in a 40 mile an hour speed limit. And uh, I thought, that's a bit weird, you know. And I spent the next day thinking, oh, I'm really pissed off now. I'm going to get a, a speeding ticket. That's a fine start to a holiday. I thought, fine start. You know, what am I going to do? Do I have to go on a speed awareness course? Am I going to get three points on my license? Is it going to make my insurance go up? When I got home, nothing. Nothing. Because I wasn't speeding. And then, blow me, on the way back home I got a flash as well. I was doing 60 in a 70 zone. And the camera still went off. So God knows what's going on with these cameras. Everything, got us, you know, we've discussed it before. This is like the fall of Rome. Everything's turned into the brown stuff. So, it's going to be uh, interesting times for the next, like, four or five generations to live through uh, the chaos that my parents and grandparents uh, cooked up for them. Anyway, yesterday I had two messages waiting for me. One from a patient who's been referred for an OPG and hasn't heard anything. And he's got a very uh, unusual case and he's got um, uh, amelogenesis imperfecta and all his teeth are flat with his gum. And uh, so I've sent him off for an OPG and they just haven't got in touch with him, which is a nuisance because he's a, a senior lecturer at Canterbury University and really he's not, you know, he's, and he's, <laughs> he's in a discipline where, you know, you thrive if you're a bit, you know, on the spectrum. So uh, he's, uh, 
he's not going to let it go, you know. So he asked if he could go anywhere else for it, and I said to him, well, it's best to light a bonfire under the people who we've already referred you to, rather than refer you somewhere else and then have to explain why we haven't referred you to the closest hospital and have another wait or an argument, or I said the alternative is you can go privately. Well, of course they, they don't want to go. Why would you want to pay for something you can get for free? So, although most people don't realise that this promise of getting something for free is not all it's cracked up to be. It's not free, because it's not free in terms of their time or my administrative time either. So, I've written another email to the uh, QEQM radiography department asking why they haven't been in touch with this bloke. In the meantime, I've had a... a <coughs> Another issue with a guy who was um, sent off for a wisdom tooth extraction, literally, you know, five months ago, and and uh, said that he didn't uh, hasn't heard anything. The reason he hasn't heard anything is because he has changed his mobile phone number, and so we gave the oral surgeons the wrong phone number. So they rang and they couldn't get through to him. Now, what do they do under those circumstances? Do they ring us and say, "Look, have you got a?" a an updated phone number for this guy or can you uh, pass on to this guy the fact he's got an appointment or something no they just cancel the referral that's it they try once possibly a couple of times to ring a number and if they can't get through they just cancel the referral it's like the patient doesn't exist you know it's not like they don't <laughs> they know the patient exists and they know that the patient needs a referral but it's just an excuse to get rid of one more patient you know to reduce their workload and what they do is they then put the onus on the referring practitioner to sort the problem out and to repeat the referral, which is obviously duplicating the work. And it's not an inconsequential amount of work either. You know, it's you know you have to um, go through the notes, uh, re re retype in the, all the patient's details, the reasons for the referral, dig out the X-ray, attach the X-ray, etc., etc., etc. Now it so happens that there's a bug in this program. It's called. Rego, Vantage Rego or something. I don't know why they call it that. I mean, you know, they couldn't... If they'd chosen a random string of 12 characters and numbers and symbols, they could not have made it less memorable. But anyway, um, it turns out there's a bug in this thing. So I spent uh, half an hour trying to uh, re-refer this patient. And then it was 2 o'clock and the patients came in. And it was about half past 4 by the time I managed to get onto their technical support. And they said, no, uh, you know, the way, the way that I, they told me to do it, the way they told me to do it, and the way that, um, you know, you should be able to do it by just re-referring the patient is not possible. You have to treat them like a new patient, type all the details in again, because the re-referral route is buggy, doesn't work, and, uh, and uh, so you just have to do it all again, you know. Now... I'm not, you know, I mean, I think to a certain extent there's a punitive element in this, in that they, they figure that if you refer them a patient and that patient doesn't conform, you know, doesn't play along with their one phone call or you're out system, then, um, you know, the, the referring practitioner should be penalised for referring a, 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 like a not a, not a, not a time-wasting referral, but a, like an incomplete or an incorrect referral. And that by getting these things shoved back in your face all the time, that you're then going to take extra care to make sure that they don't get rejected. Because if they do get rejected, what are you going to do? You can't say, oh, well, you better keep the tooth in. You know, I mean, you, this tooth's got to come out. So you have no choice but to refer them again. And in this case, it's absolutely no fault of ours. You know, it was the patient's fault that they didn't give us an up-to-date phone number. It wasn't our fault, it wasn't the hospital's fault, but the hospital could have done something about it. And as a result, the whole thing's been held up five months because I've had to do the referral, the referral's going to go off as a new referral, um, and it was, you know, it's been five months since the original referral, and now it's going to have to, he's going to the end of the queue again, which again, I think is their intention, you know. Just because you don't cross a T or dot an I, then you go back to the end of the queue and that helps them because it like helps them get people off the front of the queue doesn't it and put them back at the end and hopefully they'll give up or go private or something so anyway overall 
six hours of my time yesterday, including half an hour of my lunch hour, was spent on either on the phone or on the chat to technical support, trying to get them their system to work in a way that is a bit more. I mean, something that it ended up taking five hours, which is really referring this patient for his wisdom to, and should have taken five minutes, because underneath the note that said. Uh, Referral uh, cancelled. We couldn't couldn't contact the patient. I should have just been able to click a button saying uh, reopen reopen the referral. Details updated. But no. You'll find uh, I think as you get older that you spend more and more time just making up for the deficiencies in other people's thinking or. Uh, method of working or whatever you know <clears throat> they um, these people cause chaos they cause uh, inefficiencies and, uh, the inefficiencies are, are things that you have to cope with now the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm and you know me being pioneering again and this is not really pioneering I'm sure a lot of private dentists do this already but I'm seriously consider not referring patients into the NHS for either OPGs or wisdom teeth extraction and that's a shame because they are both uh, in both cases they are services that people pay for through their national insurance and they are entitled to receive free of charge but it's not free of charge for me for me to deal with the NHS is very costly it cost me a lot yesterday it cost me six hours of surgery time clinical time administrative time on and off uh, to to fix problems with referrals that had been carried out entirely correctly in the first case. If you you know if you assume that uh, sending off the number that we had on record for that patient was was correct, and I don't see how you, you can say that we made a mistake in sending off the phone number that we had. Okay, so he changed his number, but I mean we didn't know that. So we sent off that number in good faith. And yet, it's it's blown back on us to the extent that I've had to spend half a day sorting it all out. Now, if I was to refer privately for OPGs and privately for, for extraction of teeth, then I know for a fact I would not have all this crap, you know? I would not have to deal with a health system that is in the uh, Fender, Fender regime, uh, process of collapsing. And uh, I, I don't want to interface with these people. They're they're idiots. They've got no stake. They've got no uh, they've got no skin in the game, and they've got no um, desire to do anything to a level of uh, sort of efficiency that you find in the private sector. They can't be sacked for being incompetent. They are just like you know. Oh well, yeah. No, you'll just have to do this ton of work. Have a nice day. Type attitude. And I'm sure it's because they look at work differently. When you're salaried and in a secure job, then really what you want to do is just make sure that you have got enough work to do to justify your salary. You don't care. You, all you worry about is whether your boss thinks you're working or not. You don't care whether that work city <laughs> is productive or efficient or anything. In fact, to a certain extent, the less efficient it is, the better. Because the longer it takes, you know. They're all about skiving off and making sure they can have the longest coffee break. Whereas in the private sector, we're all about fitting more patients in and making sure that we have the shortest coffee break, or no coffee break, or no lunch hour. So, I mean, things are going well because the NHS is in, in, in a broad collapse. Because, as I've said before, that you know this COVID finally was the straw that broke the camel's back, and finally drove a coach and horses through their financial and clinical models of uh, piling it high and selling it cheap, and um, and all the dentists are crying like mad because from the first of January they've been asked to do 85% of the workload that they're contracted to carry out, having having only had to do 25% I think and then 65% and now it's been put up to 85% and of course they've all got a very hard choice now because having promised not to go private 
uh, and, turn, and, uh, and, and take all their NHS patients into the private sector, Pinky Square, they've now um, uh, got to decide whether what to do about their contracts, which are coming up to, for review at the end of March. Um, we're in January now. And, um, you know, these guys, uh, they've, <laughs> they've had a ton of money uh, for not doing as much as they thought. And the problem is not, you know, they're all saying, oh, no, we can't. How can we see 85% of our formal workload with all these restrictions on, etc., etc.? Especially the guys who are, like, there was a guy uh, published a letter yesterday in the Dentistry magazine, I think, who'd got 8,000 UDAs, which is about 240,000, well, it might be more than that, for all I know, 240,000 pounds worth of uh, turnover, a contract worth 240,000. Uh, and um, he says, no, I can't do that, I can't do that. Well, his problem is not that he can't do it. His problem is he's, been, he's already been paid. His problem is that <laughs> he's had the money for uh, one twelfth of 8,000 UDAs every month for the past year. And come 31st of December, if he hasn't delivered at least, uh, I don't know, however, you know, whatever the whatever the target is of those UDAs, then they're going to start paying the money back. So although they complain that, that they can't, uh, it, the fact that they can't do the work is what they complain about, what they're really complaining about is the fact that they can't keep the money for not doing the work. <laughs> uh, or even though they probably, you know, a lot of those 8,000 UDAs that would have been done on the National Health Service, he's ended up seeing those patients privately and got the same amount of money, if not more, uh, for doing the treatment and now he wants to um, he wants to doesn't want to pay back the money that he's been paid to do the identical work on the NHS that he doesn't deserve because he doesn't done it on the NHS so you know <clears throat> I mean speaking of someone who predicted that the NHS was going to collapse in 1990 I would just like to say a big I told you so you know it's only taken 32 years to come right, but you know we are seeing seeing signs of it now, because um, a lot of you know a lot of dentists are like, oh no, I'm going to have to decide, you know, am I am I going to have to leave the NHS if the NHS wants me to do 85% of the work for 100% of the money? I'm going to have to leave the NHS. Uh, it can't be done. <clears throat> and um, of course, dentists have always threatened to leave the NHS. You know, I mean this. Dentist Exodus. Uh, that was a headline, wasn't it? I think in the uh, Evening Standard, uh, John Major, Major Stems, Dentist Exodus. This was years ago. So dent there's always been a Dentist Exodus, um, with the exception of very few parts like um, Isle of Wight and uh, a few other little enclaves. Uh, very fairly well defined enclaves uh, there has been there has been no major exodus and I think that's what's going to happen I think what what's going to happen is that faced with the situation where they know that they can't compete in a free market for dentists because uh, the market price for dentistry is about three times what the NHS pays or it always was I mean it may be more than that now um, the NHS is going to cave in and they're going to, you know, there's going to be a lot of hooky accounting, you know, uh, worthy of Enron going on behind the scenes as they negotiate individually with these dentists to write off their debt or uh, have, have uh, make, make part repayment and, and perhaps slightly reduce their contract or something, you know, because the last thing they can do really <clears throat> is... Um, end up with a lot of uh, contracts that they can't place but I don't think that'll happen because they are, there's no such thing as an NHS contract that they can't place because there are always, there's always even if every NHS contract in the country went to some one, one bloke <laughs> or woman there would always be someone who would say yeah yeah I'll, I'll do that I'll do that you know uh, even on the principle of what they call suicide tendering which is where you tender for a contract knowing you're going to make a loss. 
or not knowing you're going to make a loss, which is even worse. You know, but <laughs> you tender for a contract that's going to cost £100,000 to fulfil, and you say, yeah, I'll do it for 80,000 quid because you're either, you're no good at maths or you're too stupid or you think that there are some other benefits, you know, there might be some other contracts around the corner. But <laughs> it's like that old saying that, you know, you make a loss on every patient, but you make it up with the volume. You know, it's, there, there'll always be someone happy to put chewing gum in people's fillings in teeth. So I don't think the NHS will have any trouble placing their contracts. Doesn't matter if they pay a pound a patient a year, they would get someone would think, oh look, <laughs> there's a pound, <laughs> there's a pound there. I'll have that. And of course, it's that attitude that's led to the collapse of uh, any sort of decent quality dentistry on the NHS. This is what's led to the uh, the <laughs> the abutment bridge. You know, the two the two unit bridge. <laughs> cantilever bridge and the uh, and the uh, root treatments that turn into extractions and the basically everything that turns into extraction right oh we're going quite well here anyway so, so that's my plan, really. I'm going to have to look into get, where to get a private OPG done. Because I know for a fact, I'll, you know, if I get it done uh, privately, I'll, I'll be able to get it done within a day or two. And what's happening is that we are, you know, we're, we're treatment planning a lot of work on these patients. The ones that have to go off OPGs, they're, they're because I, you know, I haven't got enough periapicals to, uh, to do the job. <clears throat> and um, I'm joking, we use digital. Um, and so a lot of you know, a lot of these big treatment plans depend on these OPGs, and uh, we'd, we'd like to get them back quickly so that we can get a treatment plan out to the patient. But if you send an OPG out to QEQM and it's like two months, and then they used to give the disc to the patient, and now they insist on uh, posting the disc to you. I don't even know why they do that, you know, but they change everything all the time, you know, it's all change, 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 and it's always changed for the worse, they literally uh, keep going online or going digital for the x-rays, it's all, they, they always find the worst way to do it, do you know what I mean, they're like the department, they take after the Department of Health, Department of Health got one job, you know, provide high quality dentistry, a reasonable cost and and they choose the only way really or the worst way to do it I mean there are a number of worst ways to do it and they choose the worst worst way um, and so they're really just being you know mimicked by uh, the practice the, uh, de uh, the NHS practitioners are just really just they're leading by example you know and the, pra the NHS practitioners are following there's no, there's no um, culture of uh, excellence. There's lip service to culture of excellence. I'll give you that, you know. But no, uh, no actual, no actual excellence. <laughs> <coughs> oh my God. Okay. Right. I'm just uh, gonna go back in, take some impressions. And then I'm going to cast up some full, full dentures I took impressions for yesterday in uh, composite. Not composite, what's it called? The red stuff. With a rubber base wash. And uh, going to lay down some shellac base plates. And then if you don't know what I'm talking about, then Google it. Alright, nice to talk to you. Bye.